Not such a long, long time ago, when life was moving really slow, locked up in our houses all in a row. Well, I can remember if I cried when Dan Old nearly died. Something touched me deep inside the day we were coronified. Oh, we were singing bye bye. We were scattered to houses. We learned a few lessons, and what church is about is more than just singing songs and all to call. It's about a church without walls. It's about a church without walls. Do you believe in the great command? Love your neighbor and her man to pray for all the A on your hashtag. Well, I know that you're in love with God because I saw you out in your front yard. The people came and went. It was a glorious FYM event. And we were singing bye bye. We were scattered to houses. We learned a few lessons, and what church is about is more than just singing songs and all to call. It's about a church without walls. It's about a church without walls. Hello there. I'm Brett. I'm one of the members of the Calvary staff. And I'm excited to be sharing with you uh, this morning or whenever you're watching this. Uh, as a reminder, we are in our current series called Summer School, Life Lessons for the Journey. And the idea behind this series is you're hearing from a lot of different voices and seeing some new faces, I think. Uh, and what we're doing is we're revisiting some of the material that we immersed ourselves in all of last year and now taking a look at it with fresh eyes and seeing what it's held for us right now, as well as talking a little bit about how it's affected us. So today I'm going to be revisiting the idea of turning the page, turning the page. Hopefully that doesn't sound brand new. Hopefully that reminds you of some things that we were talking about last summer into the fall. And if you remember so much of that series and uh, the things that we talked about for weeks and weeks and weeks, we're first acknowledging that God is doing something different. He is turning the page, right? In the middle of a global global pandemic, we're trying to see what God is up to. And we were acknowledging the sense of transition that everybody was feeling on almost every conceivable front. We looked at trying to be still to see that even more. We looked at trying to uh, acknowledge that we're not going back to normal, but we're going to press forward into what God has as he's turning the page. And so we're going to re be revisiting that today. And uh, first, largely, the page has turned in so many different ways. Uh, but what we're finding, I think, is that maybe for many of us, the page turn isn't all we'd hoped for or all we'd expected. And the good news is that if you're feeling that way, you're not alone, and you're not even alone from some characters in the Bible. We're going to be looking today at a couple flood stories to see not only how turning the page can affect us, but also how Christ will lead us through it. So first I wanna talk about Noah's flood. This is a story that we are all familiar with, but I want to start by talking about a, a part of the story that you probably haven't thought much about, unless you're like a, a seminary Bible student, and that is, what happened to Noah after the flood? And it's actually sort of a, a, a not quite the expected outcome you might think. Of course, Noah heard from God build this massive boat and ark and put in it all of the members of the species of animals, uh, you know, lead them two by two, male and female, into the boat. Uh, as this massive storm comes, Noah and his family and the animals, uh, and they end up being the sole survivors of this massive flood. And of course, uh, Noah releases a dove after 40 days and 40 nights to see if the waters have subsided, and the dove come back, comes back with a tree leaf. It's a good sign. And then the next dove he sends out doesn't come back at all, which means the flood is over. And when Noah leaves the ark with all of the animals, uh, he's given the same commission as Adam and Eve, actually, be fruitful Fill the earth and multiply, right? Go for it. Re, you know, this is a brand new world. Now let's start over. But what happens after that is 
maybe not what we would expect to happen to such a hero of the faith. He uh, becomes a man of the earth, is what it says, and uh, he plants grapes, and of course he turns the grapes into wine, and then of course he drinks too much wine and he gets drunk, and there's this weird story where he gets so drunk that he passes out in his tent and one of his sons does what the Bible says is uncovering his father's nakedness. It's not entirely clear what is going on here. There's a couple different good guesses, but nobody really knows. And then as a result, Noah gets up and he gets angry and he curses his son out, cusses him out, banishes him, disowns him, and then curses the next thousand generations. And then the next verse right after that is, and Noah died, and that's the end of his life. It's a very strange idea. How does this hero of the faith who builds this huge architectural wonder, the ark, and saves so much of the world and preserves it for this sort of global reset, how does he end up fall down drunk, angry beyond belief, and overreacting by cursing one of his only surviving sons? How, does, how do we get to that point? Well, believe it or not, uh, the Bible has some answers. Let me give you a bit of Bible trivia. Do you know, by chance, which of all the animals were the only animals forbidden to get on the ark by God, two by two, male and female? No? It's actually people. Yeah, it's really true. If you go back and read your Bible, you'll see that all, everything was supposed to go on the ark Two at a time, male and female, the idea being that we're going to need to repopulate everything after this global episode. But the people are instructed to get on first, the men first, Noah and his sons, off to the left, the, and his wife and their wives, off to the right. And this is actually a very sort of common shape to, in the Bible, of times of like repentance where people are expressing sorrow for the, the wickedness they've done, those kinds of things, that a lot of times there's like this celibacy included. And so Bible scholars in this section of text where there's so few details, everything matters, they've keyed into this and they say, I think that there is sort of baked into this idea, this commandment of celibacy. Well, when they're getting off the boat, uh, the Lord issues a different command. He says, go ahead and get off the boat, uh, men with the wives, and go off. And he pairs them to get off the boat, and then he gives them the same commission he gave Adam and Eve. But there's something noticeable about it. First of all, uh, he has to say it two times. Again, in a text like this where it's so sparse, some commentators have said, I think that means that there's a reluctance here to go back to life as normal. And we have felt that way, haven't we? Like the page has turned, some things have opened up with the pandemic, we've got some vaccines, we're not wearing masks as often, but there's a reluctance to go back to life as normal, isn't there? I've actually talked to some people uh, here at church who have said, you know, my favorite restaurant is is opened up now, I could go there, but I just don't have the energy to go to it anymore, right? I just, it would just be easier to stay in and order in. Or somebody else says, you know, uh, I don't want to go back to work. I've got a friend who used to work at the office five days a week. Now he's been working at home for a year. Now he has to come back for just two days a week. And he's angry, but he's laughing. He goes, if they would have made me come to work two days a week before the pandemic, I would have thought it was a huge blessing. Now it's just a huge burden. And, and studies have shown that so many people across the nation are so reluctant to get back into work like this. And actually, the New York Times just uh, wrote an article just this week uh, that named this collective thing we're experiencing. And the word is languishing, languishing. I want that to get into your thoughts, okay? Because languishing is not depression. Depression is this clinical diagnosis uh, that needs treated as such. A lot of times people can't even get out of bed. Languishing is not that. It's just this feeling of blah. And people that are languishing, they get out of bed just fine and they go and participate in the normal things. They go to the soccer games, they go to work, they go to church, but they have no sense of aim or purpose. Sort of the, the driving force is gone and they just feel blank. And and I think we see this in the Noah story, right? A lot of times when we get into a point of languishing, like Noah was languishing after the page was turned in his story, then there's always the, 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 the possibility of something worse happening and us giving ourselves to things that don't matter. Now, Noah, he's a man of the soil. He could have been planting wheat or corn, which is, might, might be what you'd expect just after a global flood, but he's planting grapes. Why is that? Is it because he likes oatmeal raisin cookies? No, of course not. It's because he's resigned. He's given himself over to this aimlessness and purposelessness. And he's languishing, and it ends up leading him into uh, you know, heavy drinking with an anger and frustration, just not doing his inner shadow work to find out what's wrong. He gives himself over to something else. You know, there's something else uh, that studies have been pointing out about our reaction to the pandemic. We're not just languishing, but there are pieces of ourselves that we've forgotten. A study uh, out of the University of Melbourne has pointed out that 
Many of us have, uh, after the pandemic, had have significant identity shifts. Now, these identity shifts can happen when, like when we get our first car, when we get married, those kinds of things. Uh, but when something like this is imposed upon us, we go through a shift in identity that we don't always know how to navigate, let alone recognize that it's even there. I've talked with people who said, you know, uh, there's pieces of myself that I remember hap- you know, having before that I just can't access anymore. I've actually felt like that. Ways of getting motivated, ways of connecting to the world that just, you know, I used to be able to kind of start the engine in some way and now it's just not there anymore. Hey, I talked to somebody who shared with me they're considering a shifting career and they got into their career with a set of passions for all the right reasons. But now here after the pandemic and after some other page turning experiences in their life, they just don't have those same motivations anymore. And so now they're thinking about changing a career. And so this is what this feels like. After the flood, we find ourselves at a place of malaise or ennui or call it what you will, languishing, where we're not entirely sure of the way forward. Let me look real quick at another uh, flood story here for you. Actually, it's the story of uh, Jonah. Believe it or not, Jonah is a flood story. Uh, It's got the waters. It's got uh, a story of uh, judgment. Of course, the city of Nineveh is the city that's going to be judged. You've got the the man of God who's supposed to deliver the message one way or the other. Uh, You've even got some linguistic cues all through the book that are meant to tie it to the flood story. So it's very clear that this is uh, meant to connect with Noah's flood. But there are significant differences in this story that let us know that we're sort of thinking about this in a different way. There's, uh, for example, in Noah's story, God regrets making mankind. But in uh, Jonah's story, he actually regrets the same Hebrew word uh, of the judgment that he's going to bring on Nineveh. Whereas in Noah's story, the man of God is on the boat and all of the wicked are under the water. In, in Jonah's story, Jonah's the one that gets thrown into the depths and the, the pagan sailors are the ones that get delivered through uh, essentially their openness and their faithfulness and those kinds of things. So there's a number of things going on here. And at the end of the day, what we see is this story is not so much about the judgments that God's leveraging on the earth the flood that's going to bury everything. It's actually about the flood that's going on inside of of Jonah. His inner world is flooded with anger and prejudice and bitterness. It's not the outer world that's, that's at risk. It's his inner world. And, you know, this is something that we struggle with too after our own flood, I think. We are conflicted. You know, I talked with somebody uh, here at Calvary not too long ago, and she shared, you know, she, she was talking about how Uh, Her life had been changed in this last year, and she said, really, God has done uh, tremendous works in in my heart and my life. And then immediately her countenance fell, and you could see guilt came across. And she said, oh, but so many people have suffered. Don't we all feel like that, though? Can't you look back at this last year or 18 months and say, boy, there are things that I can rejoice in, but then it it almost feels guilty or conflicted to say that when, when there are other things that haven't worked out in the way you thought they would. Or there are so many other people who, who suffered so greatly, maybe, maybe we can't rejoice in those same ways. This is very natural. A, a lot of us are feeling like this. Let me give you another piece of Bible trivia that, that's actually helped me. Did you know that the fish that swallowed Jonah was not God's punishment for Jonah? It was actually his vehicle for deliverance? Yeah, it's really true. If you remember the story, uh, Jonah spends three days and nights in the belly of the fish. And what you might not know is that that little phrase, three days and three nights, is uh, a very common ancient Near Eastern way to describe how far away the land of the living is from the land of the dead. So someone might say, oh man, they're gone, they're dead. Yeah, they're, how far away are they? Oh, they're three days and three nights, meaning nobody's uh, going to go there and certainly nobody comes back from the dead. Well, if he's in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, and we know he ends up getting spit out into the land of the living, we know that the fish must be traveling up and not down. The the second big clue is in chapter two, uh, Jonah issues, you know, we, we hear from him. He's actually praying in the belly of the fish, and his prayer is not a prayer for deliverance. Oh, God, please rescue me from the belly of the fish. I'm so sorry. I promise I'll never do it again. I'll listen to you. It's not a plea for mercy. It's actually a hymn of praise. And he actually says, oh God, I was down in the depths. The bars of death, he says, have actually actually wrapped around me, but you, oh Lord, delivered me. And of course, uh, here he comes up now, he's surfacing, 
uh, in the belly of the fish. And it's a little like that thing where David did that one time where he said, you know, even if I make my bed in shoal, the depths of the dead, all the way to the bottom, I still can't get away from you, God. So Jonah's experiencing something like this. And uh, of course, this, uh, the reason I like this actually is because this is a little bit how I feel post pandemic. Um, you know, there are things that have happened that, uh, that have made me stronger, but there are also things that I wish wouldn't have happened. I'll tell you uh, real quick, just personally, uh, we actually lost <clears throat> my mother-in-law. She passed away very suddenly in early November at the end of 2020. And that experience has uh, forced us to rely in, in, in some good things. It's forced us to rely on relationships that uh, in ways that we didn't know that we even had or didn't know that we could need as deeply. And they have held. It's also forced us to find new places of strength that we hadn't even considered would be those places of strength and to, to connect differently to a bunch of different things. It's forced us to see our world differently. And some of those ways are good. And while we wouldn't at all wish that we were going through this, we can see the hand of the Lord in it, but we still feel conflicted no matter how uh, good things are going, no matter what opens up or what restaurant we're eating at, we always wish, uh, or what holiday we're celebrating, we always wish that my mother-in-law was still with us. And even the good parts still feel like you're in the belly of a fish, right? And hopefully in these places of conflict, maybe what we can see is that, yeah, you know what? Even the victory, even the, the deliverance still feels like the belly of a fish at times after the flood as the page is turned. But maybe we can take a little bit of solace in the sense that the fish is going up and not going down. The thing that we thought was killing us actually is bringing us back from the dead. Well, let me touch on one more flood story here before we go. And believe it or not, it's the baptism of Jesus. The baptism of Jesus follows a number of different, uh, again, literary images that are connecting with the flood story. We've got Jesus coming up out of the waters of baptism. We've got the flood of God coming down from the sky, which, by the way, I forgot to mention that the word Jonah is actually the exact same word for dove, right? Another connection there. Jesus, the dove, we've got this uh, enunciation of his, his ministry from the Father happening. And uh, immediately thereafter, after a, a stint in the desert, 40 days and 40 nights, again, more flood imagery wrapped up in this uh, story. Jesus begins preaching the gospel. And of course, the, the text of the gospel is this, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Of course, we could do a little bit of work there to understand exactly what Jesus is saying. And given the shape of his baptism, the water, the dove, the 40 days, the 40 nights. There's, a, there's an intrinsic message wrapped up in this event even before he gets to the cross uh, and offers himself as a sacrifice. There's a bit about this, uh, this sense of this scene that the gospel message is, uh, see the world differently because the flood is over. Of course, this is a very surprising kind of message for those that are still living under Roman oppression, those who are still, you know, have Roman guards running around. They're still taxed heavily by tax collectors, right? They're still uh, seeing the world as, uh, as a very sad and broken place. And yet the message of the gospel uh, can be vocalized. See the world differently. Repent. Think differently. See the world differently because the flood is over. Jesus coming up out of the waters, right? the dove coming down. And yet another way to vocalize it, maybe something more common to uh, our uh, study last year about turning the page, maybe a way we could vocalize it and hear Jesus inviting us uh, here today is get your hopes up because the page has turned. Get your hopes up because the page has turned. Regardless of how you vocalize it, um, there is a, a, an invitation here from Jesus to participate in the gospel. Now, this is the point, if you're like me, where uh, things can get a little frustrating with Jesus because as soon as you start asking him, okay, what does that look like? Jesus kicks into riddles and stories. Wow, okay, uh, my hopes are getting up. The page is turned. Wow, the flood is over. Now what? And Jesus says something like, well, if you had eyes to see it, then you could probably see it. And we go, oh, okay. Yeah, but like, what's it, okay, what's it like? He goes, well, it's not just coming, it's already here. 
Oh, okay. So uh, it's it's not it's already here. Uh, well, what should I do? Well, if you had ears, you could probably hear it. If you had half a brain, you could probably understand it. If your heart was beating, you could feel it. Okay, I'm riffing a little bit on the words of Jesus, but if you're feeling the sting of offense like I am, then I think you're feeling it rightly. Sometimes I felt like that in this last year. I've gone, great God, you're turning the page and all I get back are riddles and stories and invitations that sound like, you know, the cone of some uh, wise man on a mountain. You know, if you could just get into it, you'd be in it. Uh -uh, How do I do that, right? Well, here's here's the truth. The New York Times article that I referenced earlier uh, has a brilliant line in it, and, and what they're finding is there's a real antidote to languishing, and the antidote to languishing is to find your flow. And the good news is that even before the New York Times in 2021 came up with a cool phrase like find your flow, the ancient Christians of old have been talking about exactly this idea exactly this path for centuries and centuries and centuries. And actually, the illustration for it, wait for it, of finding your flow is what we call the perichoresis, right? That little Trinitarian knot. It's a little illustration of the never-ending circle dance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it happens to be the very flow of life that we are invited into. So this invitation to repent, to see the world differently, to get your hopes up, this actually has three different kind of shapes to it, depending on which area of the flow you need most. So pay attention to your heart as we talk about how to get into this flow. So the very first one would be communion with Christ. And this, uh, in this flow, uh, the invitation can be vocalized Uh, let's drink together. Maybe you hear God saying to you today, let's drink together. Of course, in the, in scripture from beginning to end, there is this propensity of uh, humans to reach for the wrong things to quench their thirst. Jeremiah said, said it like this, or God through Jeremiah said, you know, you're thirsty, but you're going after wells that have no water and you've got broken cisterns that are leaking. Why don't you just come to me, an ever replenishing fountain, right? Jesus says something very similar to the woman at the well. He goes, if you had known who I was, you would have asked me for a drink and I would have given you water that you would never thirst again. See, there's this propensity where we actually try to go for things that we think are going to make us feel a little bit better, take the edge off languishing. Maybe like Noah, it's a little bit too much wine. Maybe like someone else, it's binge watching too many things on your favorite streaming channel. Whatever it is, uh, you know, we can cultivate bad habits. And what we desperately need to do is... First of all, jettison the things that are not quenching our thirst, right? And then drink very deeply of the things that will quench our thirst. There's a lot of different ways to do this. First, I would suggest, you know, really taking an inventory and finding out what are some of the broken cisterns in my life? What are some of the ways of behaving or even believing or operating in my life that maybe worked before the flood, but after the flood, after the pages turned, they're just not going to help me do what I need to do and get where I need to go. You know, you can think about ways of changing. You know, you can get online right now and you can find a master class in a new skill or a new something or other for like 10 or $15. Maybe you've got an inner nudge, an inner thirst that you've just been ignoring because it doesn't fit part of your identity. Well, maybe it's time to rethink that. Maybe you've got an inner nudge. You say, you know, I've always wanted to take up yoga. You know what? Take up yoga. Maybe you've said, you know, I really just wish I could get away for just a day and just be alone with, you know, my thoughts. You know, you should follow that leaning as the spirit hovering over the water, as the dove resting upon you, that you can find new ways of drinking and forsake the old broken cisterns so that God can come into your life. You can find deeper places of communion and rest that are uh, vitally needed in this day after the flood. The next part of the perichoresis is the part of community. And uh, the gospel invitation here, you might hear something like Jesus saying, let's eat together. And of course, uh, we're talking about now the the table of Christ. We've got this place of community. And this, this area of flow is all about being vulnerable to how much we need others in our lives. There is a very real 
post flood, post page turn, impulse to withdraw and tighten the circle. And we need to resist against that by acknowledging that we need others. We need others in a small group. We need others in our neighborhood. We need others in our community. So in this one, I would encourage you to think about the table of Jesus. And of course, he had all manner of social pariahs, lepers, and, uh, and, and prostitutes and things like that at his table. But he also had this broad spectrum of uh, what really is rightly called political uh, dissidents. We've, we, on one hand, he had zealots, and the zealots were ripe for revolution, right? On the other hand, he had tax collectors, those who were part of the arm of oppression, so to say. So you've got one group that's, you know, that says, I think what we need to do is rebuild the establishment. The other group says, we need to tear it to the ground. These two groups could not have been farther apart. I'll tell you what, they make our modern Democrat versus Republican strife in our nation look like BFFs, honestly, right? This is like way beyond CEOs versus, versus union organizers. This is as diametrically opposed as you can get. This is two polar, uh, uh, same ends of the magnet that are going to repel, you know, a hundred miles apart. And yet, here they are gathered at the table. And here's the truth about Jesus is people gather around Jesus for a thousand different reasons. That means your reason for coming to the table could be diametrically opposed to somebody else's reason for coming to the table. And yet, at the table of Christ, you're at the same table. There was a study show that showed that uh, a significant number of Americans, something close to 20, have people that were once in their lives during the pandemic or before the pandemic that they've totally stopped talking to altogether because of political differences, because of vaccine differences, because of, you know, you know wh which candidate do you support, which church do you go to? Oh my gosh, it's bonkers. They've actually written people off and blocked them and ghosted them. Maybe you've got someone like that in your life. Maybe... You've had that happen to you. And I tell you, to enter this part of the flow, what is absolutely necessary is that we fight the urge to constrict our circles and actually push out that circle so that the table is as broad as it can be for every enemy and every neighbor. That we recognize that people are coming to the table of Christ for completely different reasons. They, we hear one thing in Jesus' invitation and they hear another thing. And guess what? We're all at the same table. So here's what Jesus knows about your life that maybe you don't know. I bet he knows that your LGBT neighbor has a great curry recipe that they would love to share with you if you just invited them to. I bet they know, I bet Jesus knows that that liberal dad at the soccer game that's on the same team as your kid, he's got some great parenting advice. If you would just get to know him a little bit and, and ask him a few questions. I bet that uh, Trump supporter whose politics you just can't even understand or can, could never get behind, I bet they know the next Netflix series that you would just love. If you would just stop to talk and hear and see the human that is at the same table with you. We're all gathered around the table. Finally, I want to talk to you about our commission and calling. This gospel invitation is something along the lines of, let's build a new world. I want to read to you a quote from uh, Ekenemi Uwan, who is a public theologian. I've seen her speak one, two, one or two times. She's just brilliant. But she says this. She just wrote this in the Atlantic this week. She says, a year ago, I argued that if we grieved the world we once knew and radically accepted that we would not return to normal life, then we could build a better future. And in the U.S. now, restrictions are mostly lifted, vaccines are available, but the inequalities that predated the pandemic remain unattended to. The world has not been remade, and there are no signs that it will be. So this is a little bit of a, a downer, but what I appreciate about Akenemi Yuan's thoughts is that she's giving voice to the biggest parts of this flow that we desperately need to be a part of. I'll tell you what, if we languish, if we give ourselves to the languishing, we will never be able to participate in the kingdom that is coming. Those that can see the kingdom most vividly are those that participate in it with the most heart and the most passion. I'll tell you what we need is the ability to dream again about the better future that is possible through the Spirit and those who are yielded to Christ's call. Now, Maybe uh, like, uh, like Noah, like the earlier stories, like some of the statistics I've shared, maybe you feel like part of your passion isn't here anymore. Maybe you feel like the thing that got you here just left the building, right? 
Well, it's time to start think, connecting again with who we are. You know, some of you know uh, Terry Walling. He's, uh, he lives out in Chico, California, and he's sort of uh, our Calvary site out in Chico. But he's a, a brilliant um, uh, life coach who coaches people to the next level. Maybe it's time to reach out to a life coach like Terry and start getting some input to, to figure out again, okay, this is how I was wired and this is what got me here, but what's going to take me to this next level, to this next place after the flood? How can I contribute to building a new world? Maybe it's uh, you know building a new world in my neighborhood or maybe it's answering social injustices in our nation, whatever it is, uh, we know that we have to dream for more and we have to bring ourselves into this thing and hear God rewrite our identity, speak new life into us, and give us clarity about our part of this thing. Now, this whole thing is a flow. You don't just start in one and end in one. You're never going to rediscover your commission and calling without communing right? In, in completely different ways, shutting things down, making room for the voice of God. You're never going to uh, make room for the voice of God by distancing yourself from community. You need to hear what God is saying to other people in order to hear what God is saying to you. And, and of course, community in and of itself is great, but, but we must gather again together to build a new world. All three of these are part of the flow of entering into what God has for us after the flood, after the pages turn. I bless you and I hope that God speaks to you clearly and that you find your flow and your way out and into the new world that God is building. In Jesus' name.